for a story of the most miserable night in my life. Gather around, kids. Uh, I'm 19. Uh, it's circa 2005, and we are at Texas A&M. My people. And we are, uh, a group of us, like 20 of us, uh, decided we're going to do the most spiritual thing that any Christian can do. We're going to have an all-night prayer meeting. We're going to do this thing. So we grabbed one of our pastors. We found like this little house out a couple uh, hours outside of town. And we get in the car and we head to what's going to be just eight hours of spiritual bliss, nirvana with the Lord. We're just going to be sitting with him, talking with him. It's going to be amazing. We get to this place. I, I don't actually know anything about how, who found the place. It was very creepy, actually. It was in like a swamp. The house was on stilts. It was like abandoned and disheveled. But we went in, and it was fine because we were just filled with spiritual fervor. And uh, we uh, go into the living room. We sit, and we do the prayer circle thing. We're circled up, and we're amped, right? I'm ready. I've got like 19 things I'm ready to play. I mean, you know, we got eight hours. So I came, you know, prepared with thoughts and requests. And, and, you know, there's that awkward, you know, minute or two before the ball gets rolling. And now it's rolling. And people are asking for this, asking for that, praising God for this. Yes, Lord. Amen. Oh, this is great. Okay. At 45 minutes passes. An hour passes. Hour and a half passes. Sweet. Look down at my watch. Eight minutes. It's eight minutes. <laughs> Nothing. What is happening? Is this what, prayer, is this what a prayer meeting is? This is the worst thing in my life, but I can't, I can't, I can't bounce because the girl that I just asked to start dating me is sitting right across from me and I'm about to, you know, have five kids with her in the future and I can't, uh, I can't let her down. So I got to play the spiritual card, you know, so now I'm bringing out whatever other cards I thought I played everything. Now I'm just bringing out these and thou's trying to make it a little bit more spiritual. Doth God rot your soul on my soul and just trying anything to like, I can't stay in it. I'm just, I'm wiped and we're like 15 minutes deep in this thing. And so I, 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 do what any spiritual person does in that moment. I get up and I go on a prayer walk, which is a, a Christian way to leave a room. And, uh, and so I get up and, and, and it's seriously, I got out of that place and uh, I'm just going to walk around guys. And I just walked, this is a true story. I just walked to my car and I didn't leave. I just stared at my car for like four hours. I just, there's my car. There's my, I'm just looking at my steering wheel, fantasizing about me driving off into oblivion. How, can, how fast can I get out of this place? And then, of course, you know, all of those thoughts are happening. The, the guilt monster shows up, and, he, and he's like, really, bro? Mr. Christian, you can't even pray for one hour, right? And I'm, so now I'm feeling terrible about myself because I, I, because I don't want to be here, but I super don't want to be here. I'm just begging God to bring the, my, my prayer request at night is bring the sun up. Just bring it up and just turn me into stone or whatever you got to do to get me out of this. I don't know what's going on. It was, I'm telling you, it was the most miserable night of my life and I've seen Expendables too, okay? It, it, it was so bad, so bad. And, 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 and I love God, that's the thing. But I, I, I actually love, I actually like talking to him, but it was, but it was so bad. And, and I don't think I'm alone in this. There's something just unique uniquely hard about prayer, isn't it? There's something about it, right? There's a resistance in, I feel like, every Christian to this spiritual rhythm, this habit. You either have no time, just so busy, got you know, 19 irons on the fire, just, I got no time, or when you are praying, gosh, you're just so distracted and kind of all over the place, or you, you find yourself praying and asking for things God doesn't answer, then that cynic shows up in you, and he's like, oh, of course, he never answers, right? Or uh, he does answer, and the, the cynic shows up again, and he's like, ah, it probably would have happened anyways, even if I hadn't have asked. And just, it's really a complex thing that happens when we're doing the prayer thing. Prayer is like that one spiritual discipline that gives you no kickbacks, too, right? You get, like, like, you don't even have to really be a Christian, and you can get something out of Bible reading, right? You can at least get smarter at the end of it, right? You don't have to be a spiritual person at all, and if you're sharing the gospel with people, and somebody trusts Jesus, I mean, that's an amazing feeling. There's some kick, there's some residual, like, give and take happening with prayer. Me in a prayer closet for an hour by myself, I get nothing, right? You don't know about it. They don't know about it. I'm just there, if, if you don't enjoy Jesus, you're going to find out in about five seconds in your prayer closet, right? You're going to find out just how real this thing is. Pray, my point is just to say this. If prayer is hard, right? 
it's hard. It's a weird thing. It, it, it's always been this way for me, and I'm sure it is for you. But then, then when I think about that and how difficult it is, I was thinking about it this week, and, and God brought uh, 1 John 5, 3 to mind, uh, where John's writing, and he, he says this about all the commands of God. He says his commandments are not burdensome. And I'm like, I disagree, right? Because, because we just read Paul in 1 Thessalonians 5 and just in this litany of, of um, uh, sort of ways that a Christian ought to live, he just throws in there casually, verse 17, pray without ceasing. I'm like, who, pray without, ce-? the command of the Bible is never don't pray. Right, this thing that I'm already not good at and, and, and I, do, I have to do it perpetually, I'm always, always to be praying, Right, that feels exhausted. The bar feels so high, and I just uh, unachievable, and it's and it's hard, and I don't know what to do, and yet it's supposed to not be burdensome. And if it's if his commandments aren't burdensome, but we're all burdened by prayer, what are we missing? That's really the question, isn't it? The Bible says to pray, and this isn't a burden for you, and I feel burdened. What's wrong? What's the disconnect? And I just want to submit that I think the thing that we're missing is this. We are, we are missing the right object in prayer. That's what I want us to consider today. Might we be missing the right object? What if what's made prayer so hard for us is we've been focusing on the wrong thing? Let me explain what I mean. Uh, if I sit you down for a steak dinner and then I hold up a, a fork, I just... I happen to carry one in my, I don't, you, you don't? Nope. Uh, and, and I sit you down for the steak dinner and then I begin to regale you with the anatomy of the fork and the history of the fork and, uh, and uh, the proper fork technique, right? It's a clench, stab, grab movement. It's one of these, right? And we don't grab it like this. We're not apes, people, right? And, and then, and then uh, I, we, I begin to debate with you about the merits of the, the, the four-prong approach versus the uh, more liberal three-prong approach. And uh, don't even get me started on the five-prongers. And, uh, and, and by the end of all of that, after we've sort of turned this thing round and round and talked about all the facets of it, my, my question is this. Is your mouth watering? Are you just like chomping at the bit for that steak now that we've just like stared at this piece of metal for 15 minutes together? No, here's the thing. You're probably a little bit smarter about fork technology and method, uh, but you don't really care any differently about the steak, right? And and this this is our problem. Prayer is functionally like a fork to us. And what we've been doing for so long, I feel like, is we stare at this fork and we look at it and we we look at it and we look at it and then we go, gosh, I just don't have an appetite. And we wonder why we're not hungry. Because forks don't make you hungry, right? But if I sat you down for steak dinner and I told you about the 16 ounce Wagyu bone and ribeye that's coming your way in about eight minutes. And that it's coming from a cow that has had a Swedish massage every day for the past two years as it nurses baby formula, just staring at a picture of you, just can't wait for the day that you're gonna eat this thing for dinner. That the marbling in this thing is gonna make you lose your marbles. Like it's gonna blow your mind. This will be the best bite of meat you've ever had in your life. If I, if I tell you that, can I tell you what, what's true? You're gonna figure out the fork thing pretty quick, right? You're gonna figure it out. Why? Be- because I need an appetite if I wanna eat. And if I just stare at this all day, I'm not gonna have it. I'm staring at the wrong thing. We need to gaze at the meal, not the method. Do you see? We need the steak 
if we want to eat. We need the Lord if we want to pray. We need a vision for who God is if we want to be people who feast on him, who linger with him, who sit with him. This is, I think, one of the reasons why prayer is such a challenge for us is because we picked up this thinking this is going to solve our appetite problem when all the while God stands there waiting to be desired for us, lauded by us, gazed at by us. And when that happens, all of a sudden an appetite starts to grow and I begin to move toward him. That's the way we become a praying people. And don't you want that? I, yes? I want that, man. I so want that. And so what we're going to do today is basically that. I want us to um, stare at the steak, to, to, to think of the meal that is God, to consider some attributes about God that are gonna sort of whet our appetite for him. We're gonna do that for most of the sermon because because we need an appetite before anything. And then and then we will move on to, to consider prayer itself for a bit because there there is some merit to considering method and best practices and good habits and things like that. There, there's merit there, but you gotta wanna eat first. And that, that's my point. So first the steak, then the fork, yes? Okay. Uh, let's just consider God this morning. I want to consider him with you. We could talk uh, about the Lord uh, in a thousand different ways. There's a thousand different facets of his nature or his promises. We could grab any number of attributes we wanted to to just say, man, treasure this and something will change in you. I, I grabbed three that I think are particularly important that if, if we could see and savor these attributes of our God, it would do something to our desire to want to move toward him in conversation, to linger with him. Uh, and so here, here's the three that I've chosen. The, the, the first is this, uh, an attribute about him that, that will entice us to draw near to him. Uh, it's this, our God is love. That seems rudimentary, but just be with me here. Our God is love. Now this is uh, what the Bible testifies uh, throughout uh, that God is love. The, the, that's explicitly said in 1 John 4, 8. John's writing and he writes, God is love. We all know this verse. Now let me just be clear for a moment for all my hippie friends in the room. God is love is not the same as love is God, right? Jimmy is pale is not the same thing as pale is Jimmy, right? Pale is an attribute of Jimmy. Love is an attribute of God, but it is such an attribute that when John is penning his letter, he chooses to use the noun to describe God. God love is so fundamental to who God is that, that it's more proper to say he is love itself than to say he is just loving, right? God is love. That's what the t scriptures testify uh, to. And, and now what do we mean though, right? Because everybody's got a, a definition of love, God's love. What do we mean? What does the scripture mean when, when it says God is love? Well, I think uh, Wayne Grudem gives a, a helpful definition for us as he's looking at God's word and trying to synthesize God's love. He says this about it. God's love is God eternally giving himself for the benefit of others. That's a great, simple, clear definition. God, God's love is God eternally giving himself for the benefit of others. That, that somewhere in God, there's this eternal impulse to give of himself to see you thrive and flourish and come alive. And, and, it, and it's not just that that impulse in him showed up when he made you. God has always been doing this because God is three in one. The father has always had an impulse within himself to give of himself to benefit the son, to, to cause the son's delight. And the son's de delight is to cause delight in the father and the spirit is doing that for the father and the son and the father and the son for the spirit. So that from eternity past, God has had eternal reps in expressing and receiving Love, he is love. And then one day that love spills out over onto the canvas of creation as he makes us, he makes people. And that love now is being expressed to his creatures in, in a million different kindnesses. We often call it things like common grace and things like that. God made you, for instance, because he loves you. 
you exist because God loves you. you. You you have been preserved till this day right now because he loves you. If you're breathing in this room right now, it's because God has love for you. James will say it like this in James 1.17, every good and perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, right? Remember that? Have you ever had a good day? Have you ever had anything go your way? The scripture's saying that has come from the hand of a loving God in kindnesses towards you. It's all an expression of his love toward you. God is so much love that he even expresses that type of thing to his enemies. Do you remember what uh, Jesus said in Matthew 5, 45? He makes the sun to rise on the evil and the good. He sends the rain on the just and the unjust. God's indiscriminate in a certain type of expression of his love. God will do good to you for a time, even if you hate him. That's how much God is love. It's breathtaking, it's breathtaking. And yet, we know as Christians that, that is, uh, that's just a dim shadow of the full display of God's love because we know that there is an expression of his sort of self-giving impetus to, to see you and I thrive and be benefited that trumps all others and that is the sending of his son to die in the place of sinners, right? The gospel is the paramount expression of God's love. Do you want to know if God loves? How can we know that? The Bible will say over and over, you can know that because God sent his son. We see that in Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates his own love toward us. Hey God, will you, sh- will you show me you love me? Just demonstrate it. God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. How can you know there's a loving God in heaven? You ever wrestle with that? You ever debate, is he loving or not? You answer it with the scriptures because he sent his son. He sent his son for me. Yet while I was yet a sinner, God sent his son to die for me. That's how we can know. It's the paramount expression of God's love. So just for a moment, I just forget all the weird stuff you think about prayer and the difficulty you might have with it. And just, just imagine with me that there is a person, imagine this, on earth in your life who is actually like this. Just imagine if that were true, for a person to be actually like what I just described, whose every impulse is to lay his preferences aside to see you win in life, to see you thrive, to see you come alive, to see joy explode in your life, to see the best version of you come out. Uh, Imagine that person person exists. Do, Do you see how natural it feels to want to take steps toward that person? I mean, it's the most natural, right response in the world. If that's true, if that guy is out there, that's the most natural thing in the world to move toward, right? It's the most attractive quality we can kind of fathom in a person. It's what everybody who's looking for a relationship is looking for. We're looking for that, a, a posture of self-sacrifice for the good of others. Ladies, you're telling me if, if a guy in your dating relationship was wired like this where every impulse in him was to set aside his own needs and preferences to see you win and thrive and flourish and come alive. Like even at great cost to himself, he's doing all the things that he can to see you be at your best. You telling me you wouldn't be writing a marriage certificate on a cocktail napkin on date three, sliding that across the table, just sign right here, buddy, don't worry about it, right? Of course you would, we all want, that's so attractive. And that is what God is at his core. Do you see that? Like fundamentally at his core, God is love. That's breathtaking. That sounds like someone you'd want to be with. So God is love. He's not just love. God is sovereign. This is so huge for us to consider as we're wanting an appetite to move toward God in prayer. God is sovereign. Now, I love the word sovereign. I love sovereignty. Sovereignty means power. It's the ability to do what you want. If you're a sovereign nation, it means nobody's the boss of you but you, right? Sovereign power, sovereign nation. If if a king is sovereign, he gets to do what he wants to do. And when we're thinking about God's sovereignty in scripture, listen to how the Bible talks about God's power, his authority, his sovereignty, his ability to do what he wants when he wants. Listen to Jeremiah 32, 27. Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh is everything. 
too difficult for me? Answer, no. Isn't that an amazing verse? Is, is there anything you could think of that is too difficult for God? No. It's, it, it is not too difficult for him because he can do anything, and he does do whatever he wants. Psalm 115, 3 says, but our God is in the heavens. He does, I love this, whatever pleases him. What, what do you want to do today, God? Well, I don't know, but whatever I want to do, I'm going to do it because I'm God. I'm the sovereign one. No one acts on me. I act. Whatever I want to do, I do and accomplish. I am mighty and sovereign. See, that, that is what his sovereignty means. He is unacted upon. So that, that's sovereignty like on a macro level, but let's bring it down for a moment. In what ways does he express that sovereignty? Right? And, and how, how does that show up? Uh, the, this could be 20 sermons with a thousand texts. I'm picking just two or three. L- let me just grab a couple for you. Uh, in what ways is he sovereign? God is sovereign over chance, the person and the reality. I, I don't know if your name is Chance, he's sovereign over you. Um, Proverbs sixteen thirty three: the lot is cast in the lap. That's like dice. The lot is cast in the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. You think it was bad luck last year in Vegas where you lost everything? No. God took your money. It landed on red because God said red. It landed on black because God said black. God is, every moment that we go, oh, it was luck, it was chance, it was, no, it was God. God, the the lot's cast into the lap, but every, every decision, every Powerball that you've lost, stop playing Powerball. Every Powerball that you've lost, God did that, he made you lose. He is sovereign over chance. He's sovereign over weather. Uh, ver, uh, Job 37, uh, 10 through 13, by the breath of God, ice is given and the broad waters uh, are frozen fast. He loads thick, uh, the thick cloud with moisture. The clouds scatter his lightning. They turn around and around by his guidance, that sound familiar, uh, to, to accomplish all that he commands them on the face of the habitable world. Listen to this. Whether for correction or for his land or for love, he causes it to happen. God is in control of everything that happens in the sky every time. He even gives the reason for it, for correction, or for his land, or for just love, to express loving kindness to a person. You remember Snowvid 19 last year? God did that, right? That's him, it's his idea, he did it. He's he's in control of all of that. Chance, uh, weather, Uh, what about the government? Let's talk about that, that's fun. Uh, Proverbs 21.1, everyone needs to memorize this verse. The king's heart is a stream of water in the hands of the Lord. He turns it wherever he will. Biden is in the White House because of God. You know that, right? Uh, And before him, Trump was in the White House because of God. And before him, it was Obama because of God and Bush because... God is the Lord over Vladimir Putin. He's the Lord of Vladimir Zelensky. He is the Lord over every superpower. He's the Lord over every micropower. He's the Lord over every government. He raises up kings. He topples kings. He's in charge of all of it. Again, put aside your difficulty with prayer for a moment. What if you actually, actually believed this? Didn't just know it intellectually, but lived and believed this. How would that change you? Can I just talk to those of you who feel deeply about politics? You got an opinion in here, which twin, since 2016 is everybody, okay? Uh, can, can I just talk to you for a moment? If you, if we really believed, really believed at the core of who we are, that God does whatever he pleases, and that a king's heart is just like, it's just like H2O hitting the palms of a, of a person. Just, he just points it wherever he wants. If we actually believed that, I bet we would have so many less whiny Christians and so many more Christians with their faces to the ground pleading with the almighty God to affect our country. Do you, do, do you complain and not pray? That is unchristian. If you are calling yourself a follower of Jesus, it means you say yes to all of these truths about God, which means you need to shut your mouth to your whining 
and start opening your mouth to the Lord, the only one who can actually do something about anything. Yes? Let's plead to him. Let's stop being these pessimistic grumblers and start pleading with God to do something. You don't need to know more prayer tips. You need to believe God changes king's hearts. And if he can change a king's heart, he can change a president's heart or my son's heart or my neighbor's heart or my own heart. He's sovereign, so I pray, so I move toward him. He is a feast, so I get hungry for him. He's the one who can do something, so I move toward him. This is what we need. We need a vision of God. He is love. He is sovereign. But not only that, he is near. Here, here's what I mean. Uh, there's one other thing we, we need to see if we're gonna have a real appetite uh, f- to pray. God can't just be love and sovereign. He has to be near. Because if he's just loving and if he's just strong, but he's, say, a million miles away, uh, that doesn't do me any good. I, I, I need to to be sure of and glad about him in proximity toward me, seeing me, involved with me, concerned with me, familiar with what's going on in my life. For for me to have an awareness of that and be glad about that is going to change whether or not I bring my request to him or not, right? Now, you hear this and you go, Jimmy, this is a kind of an obvious one. I know, of course I know he's near. God's uh, everywhere. Uh, He's omnipresent. And I know he has a special nearness to Christians. I believe that's true. I I think you do believe that. I, I believe most Christians have an awareness of that, but we don't delight in it. And and here's why I don't think we delight in it. I think we don't delight in it because we can't imagine it, fundamentally, this, uh, I'm gonna have to sell you on this here in a second, but I think at our core, we, we don't, we can't imagine a person that good being that close. Here's what I mean. When I read my Bible, I see this pattern over and over and over. I see people, broken people, sinful people, encountering the, the holy God, and their desire is not to step forward and talk to him about their life and their neighbor, and pray for their kids. Their their response is to say, get away. Get away, I can't, can't. you're too holy. Do you remember Peter, after he sees the the fish miracle with Jesus in Luke? uh, Luke 5, 8, he says this, when Simon Peter saw it, the miracle take place, he fell down at Jesus' feet, saying, depart from me, from a sinful man, O Lord. His impulse, when he saw his brokenness, and then he saw the wholeness of Jesus was not to move near him, but to say, depart from me. I can't be in proximity to you. I know that you and I know intellectually God is near. I just don't think we like it. And so I think we squash it down. And we, 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 one of the reasons we're not bringing our requests to the Lord, not talking to the Lord so much, is because deep down somewhere in us, if we're honest, I think there's a shame a guilt, an embarrassment, a resistance toward that proximity. When brokenness collides with wholeness, the impulse is not to move toward, but to move away. And the irony is that's the exact problem that the gospel came to solve for us. When Jesus came, he came to remove the obstacle of my sin, remove the the banner over my life as sinning person, sinful person, covered by the wrath of God, and instead give me a new identity that says his son or daughter, that that he declares me righteous so that when I come to him, I'm coming perceived by my God as actually whole for the first time. That, that when he sees me, he sees me approved, he sees me as delightful, he sees me as righteous so I can come to him. I can be in his presence now and that be okay. You know, the lost world is always gonna have a problem with this. Their brokenness is gonna meet God's wholeness and they're gonna resist. Darkness flees from light, we know this. But, but Christians, we shouldn't be like that. We have in Christ been put back together in such a way that the company of God is a gift to us. 
I know you know this intellectually, but do you enjoy his company? Do you, do you delight in his nearness? It's the only way that you're actually gonna wanna invite him into your suffering, invite him into that sin struggle where you stumble again. You're not gonna wanna talk to him if you think that his presence is just gonna obliterate you. Somewhere deep down in you, you still think that. You have to let that go and understand that declared over you is this, righteous by the blood of the lamb. And so I can come now. And come be in his presence. It will change everything for you. It changed everything for me when I was a teenager. I told you guys this story about a year ago. Um, 17 years old, addicted to porn, struggling with all kinds of stuff. I was in my bedroom, stumbled again, just felt awful. I remember saying out loud on my knees to God in my room, God, if you want to go, I understand. I would want to go if I were you. I can't imagine how you could be here with me. And then in that moment, as I'm thinking that, as I just feel just the most amount of despair I've maybe ever felt, I have a vision in that moment. I see myself kneeling on the ground and I see the Lord Jesus come into the frame and just put his hand up on my back like this. And for about five seconds, I just see this picture. The, the one kid who's broken, sinful, ugly, dirty, can't imagine how holiness could be in proximity to him. And then the beautiful, pure holy, righteous one, God himself, in the same room, kneeling with me, arm on me. And it changed me. I realized, you no, know, his nearness really is my good, like Psalm 73 says. No, it's, it's not just that he's loving out there and he's sovereign out there, it's that he's near and I actually want him near now. It's not depart from me, it's I have no good apart from you. I have to be with you. It will change you to settle the fact that you are declared righteous if you've trusted in the Son and that his nearness really is your good. So some of you need to settle that today and just enjoy him. And do you see, if this God really is who he says he is, if he really is that loving, that in control, that sovereign, that mighty, and that near, and that's a good thing, what are you gonna wanna do? you're gonna wanna feast. You're gonna wanna step toward him. You're gonna wanna open up your life to him. You're gonna wanna, with all the bumps and warts and all, just live revealed and exposed to him, bring him into your messes, bring him into your struggles, into your sins, confessing to him, asking him for grace, asking him for mercy on your life and your family. You're gonna be inviting him into moments of celebration. You're gonna be talking to him because you want to be with this God. We see the meal for what it is. And it's a delight, and I'm a yes to it. It changes everything, do you see? When you, when you have the steak, when you got the meal before you, you have an appetite. Now, if that's true, if even in the sermon, some of that has happened in some of us, and we're like, yeah, okay, yes, I have some appetite now, I want him. Great, now it's time to talk a little bit about prayer, yeah? Now let's look at the fork for a bit. Because it is right to, to go, okay, I want to, I want to now dine, feast on him in such a way that um, there's some resiliency, that I can do it long term, that, that the payoff is what it needs to be. And, uh, and so let's talk about prayer. I, I wanted to, uh, to just bring up three things that in my experience as a person walking with God uh, have been incredibly helpful for me in my prayer life, that as I want to dine on Christ, walking in sort of these three things have been so helpful to awaken in me an even more robust experience of talking uh, and listening to the Lord. Uh, and here they are. Uh, what, what would be good for us to know about the habit of prayer? Three quick things. The first is this. Pray casually and formally. Pray casually and formally. Uh, one of the um, tricky things about pray without ceasing, like Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5, uh, is um, it can give the impression that all we're doing is sort of like that on-the-go prayer stuff. You know, like, well, I've, yeah, as I drive, I'm praying. As, I, as I'm feeding my kids, as I'm, uh, I'm praying. As I'm doing my homework, I'm just talking to the Lord. And there's like, and, and that is right. We should have a, a constant rumble of just talking to the Lord. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, but that is insufficient if that's all you're doing. And that's not what scripture models either. You need focused time with your father, just you and him. You need that to thrive. And the reason I know that is because Jesus needed that. Jesus was the most connected person to God ever right? 
He's the second person of the Trinity. And yet, he was constantly in scripture, what? Sneaking off to a desolate place to pray, to spend time with the Lord. If Jesus needs alone time with the Lord, you need alone time with the Lord, right? So, so you need to invite that into your life. You need to create space for you to just have dedicated time with the Lord. So the challenge is this. Uh, you need to pick a time and a place for that to happen. If you're not doing that already, or if you are, you need to solidify a time and a place. If you don't plan it, it ain't gonna happen. A time and a place where you can sit with God and just have extended time to just hear from him, talk to him, build that into your day. For me in college, it looked like my time uh, was any time before I was starting my homework. I knew if I started homework, if I started school, I would never show up uh, to the table with God after that. There was too much to do. So I said, before I do a bit of schoolwork, I'm sitting down and I'm sitting with the Lord. And, and it was amazing. And, and my space was in my bedroom at my desk. So that was happening every day. And it was amazing. God was blowing up my heart with just enjoyment for him. And in his mercy, he always gave me enough time to finish all my work. So it, it was great. That, that was me in college. I know Kelly, uh, right now, it's, uh, it's before the sun comes up, right? Because we have 150 kids and uh, they all talk to her all the time. And, uh, and so she knows I have to be in the living room, quiet, no kids, right? Everybody unconscious but me, that's, that's the magic hour, right? And, and she spends time talking to the Lord there. Where's your time? Where's your place? Identify that. Make a plan. If you don't plan it, it probably won't happen. So plan it. Uh, number two, uh, let God's word lead your words. Uh, this is another way to say you need the Bible, in your prayer life. Uh, you should not be praying independent from the, the word of God rolling around in your head. It doesn't mean you always have to, buy, have to have a Bible open to pray, but it means the word of God should inform and inspire all of our prayers. Um, for me, it, it looks like this. I, I will have the word in front of me, I'll be reading something, and I just read until something in the word awakens in me a, an appreciation for for an attribute of God or a promise of God or something God did for me and I just stop and I turn that into a prayer and now I'm thanking God, now I'm praising God and then I'm back reading and I'm reading again and, and I read until I bump into something that doesn't make sense, which is very often and I hit that and I turn that into a prayer. I start talking to the Lord about what this means and why he would put that there and why didn't he say this other thing. I just bring those requests to him. It's not even that I get an instant answer. Sometimes it takes some study of the word like we're gonna talk about next week uh, to, to mine that out but I bring those things to the Lord. The reading the word also inf informs my theology, so I'm not some, praying to some whack-jack, non-existent God out there, but I'm praying to the real God, right? I get to know who he is, and then I talk to the actual God based on that. Use the word and let the word be the, the launching pad for every prayer. It's so much more helpful and effective. Number three, and then we're done. <clears throat> Pen your prayers. Not, this, is a, this isn't a thus saith the Lord thing. This is a, I have found this helpful over the years. This isn't every prayer you pray you have to write down. This is just saying there's something so powerful about uh, you recording and writing down your prayers to the Lord. I've uh, been doing this since I was 15, 16 years old, and it has been probably the number one or two thing that has helped mature me as a Christian. Here's, here's why I love writing my prayers. Uh, one, because uh, if you're a distractible person, it's, it's hard to like uh, write crazy ADD words, right? If you know a period's coming at the end of the sentence, you're gonna think a little bit more linearly. Right? And so what writing does is it helps us focus. It helps us kind of clearly say a thing to the Lord, make sure it makes sense, and, and, and move on. So if, if you find that you're, you're a, a mind-wandering kind of person like me, uh, writing your prayers could be, actually be really helpful for you. And here's the other reason I love writing my prayers, because it gives me a record of God's faithfulness. I now have a permanent record of God's faithfulness. When we write our prayers, we have a better shot of remembering the requests we make to him and then watching how he answers. This, I brought this today. This is uh, the second most valuable possession I own. Doesn't look like much. Uh, this is my first journal, my first prayer journal from when I was uh, 15, 16 years old. Uh, just, it's pretty fancy, I don't wanna brag, but uh, um, it's, uh, it's got every day that I met with the Lord, and I met with him every day uh, from about 
uh, September 2002 to sometime in 03. And I've got dozens of these sitting on my shelf at home, but I wanted to bring my first one for you because this, uh, this is where it started for me in a lot of ways. And I just want you to listen to, this is the first sentence, first prayer of my first prayer journal ever as a uh, 15 year old. Uh, 9.14.02, first sentence. Oh Lord, everything is falling apart. It's the first thing I said to the Lord in prayer. And, uh, and what I love about this is it didn't stay that way. As I prayed, and brought my requests and my burdens and my temptations and my struggles to him. And I kept writing, I kept praying, I kept coming back to him, kept coming back. Now I have this record that I can flip through and I can watch this immature, addicted, scared, glory hungry kid go from one degree of maturity to another, one prayer answered to another, to another, to another. What a great gift this is to me in my late thirties. What a great gift this will be to me on my deathbed when I remember just, does God do anything? Is he, is he moving at all? Can he be trusted? Have this. So I would so encourage you, get a cheap prayer journal. Just start writing. Oh, I think we have prayer journals out there. Uh, start recording your prayers. I think it will so encourage you in the end. Most importantly, we want to feast on the Lord. So whatever you do, remember that it's not so much about the utensil, it's about the meal. And so let's, let's go to the Lord right now, that great meal, the bread of life, and, and talk to him. Father, we love you and we thank you for, uh, for your promise to be a feast for us. Lord, we are grateful for Jesus who is the bread of life and we so want to dine with him and dine on him. He is the satisfier of our souls. And so God, would you help us to have a clearer vision of who you are so that it would be an impulse for us to move towards you in prayer. It wouldn't be a duty, it wouldn't be a burden, it would be a delight. God, work that kind of posture into our heart. And Lord, for those of, you, for those of us in the room who haven't trusted you yet, haven't feasted on you for the first time, may that take place right now. May they cast themselves on Jesus, the one who paid for their sin and brought them into a relationship with him. Lord, we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen.